our first cool scientist actually found his passion through video games. He started playing video, sorry parents. <laughs> started playing video games, kind of got inspired by all of that programming, and he later went on to build some robots, and we think that they are going to be the robots of the future. So please welcome our very first cool scientist, Chad Jenkins. Hi, before I introduce my dad, let me introduce myself. I'm Morgan Jenkins, and I have grown up around robots. Why? Because my dad has a cool job. You could say that I have been working with my dad for over 10 years. From a very early age, we had a lot of robots around our house. My brother and sister have been hanging around robots since they were little, too. The robots we have in our home are pretty small, like the Roomba vacuum. When I was much younger, I could vacuum up my own crumbs using the Roomba. Of course, my brother also liked to follow the Roomba around the house. When my dad brought home the Roomba from the lab, we took it outside and made it follow me using an AR tag. An AR tag is a square with black and white symbols on it. The robot can recognize it and then follow me. Here, another robot is able to follow my sister without an AR tag. Sometimes, it looks like we are the ones following the robots around, but really, that is just because the robot has been programmed to keep a safe distance. My dad uses Hook's Law to make sure this happens. Did somebody say Hook? Not that Hook. Arr! We are lucky that my dad gets to bring home some of his work for us to see, but when I go to my dad's office, that is when I get to see the big, cool robots, like the PR2. But we have to be careful because the PR2 costs as much as some houses. One time, we helped the PR2 build block towers. I have also seen the PR2 deliver sodas from one place to another, which I think everyone will want at their house. Hi, Morgan. Hi, Dad. I'll let you take it from here. Thank you very much. So, hi, my name is Chad Jenkins. Uh, I'm an associate professor of computer science at Brown University, uh, where, um, and I should note that's the same Brown University that, it, that strikes fear into many a parent's savings accounts. Um, <laughs> but uh, at Brown, I actually lead a great team of students and researchers where we get to work with some of the coolest robots on the planet and beyond. Uh, these robots can roll, walk, fly, run, grab things, follow people, deliver, but still can't do most of what we want them to do. And our job is to write more and more sophisticated computer programs that allow robots to do more for people, to do the things we want them to do. But this isn't just a cool jobs talk. This is a recruitment talk. We actually need your help to make robots a future, robotics a future for reality, for a reality for the future. And so we need you to learn how to program just like us. And so we're going to try and get you to program uh, through this talk. Um, so when I was a kid, like Morgan and like many of you out there, uh, there were no robots. And robots were purely, uh, purely science fiction. Not only that, there were no computers or video games either. Uh, until the day my parents changed my life, uh, <laughs> December 25th, 1981, uh, when they brought home this the Atari 2600 video game console, yeah. Uh, <laughs> with the Space Invaders cartridge. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, and so, um, so even back then, we hooked up to a TV set like you do now, but most TV sets back then were only black and white. We didn't, have, didn't necessarily have color. But I spent a lot of my time uh, playing video games like, like this. I spent endless hours doing this. Uh, <laughs> this, these games might, might seem simplistic or even lame by, by, by today's standards, uh, but it was totally cool for 1981, and, uh, <laughs> and, um, and just scratching the surface of what we could do today. And so I spent, you know, I played games like, like this one too, so this is, this is Kaboom. I, I played a lot of that uh, to the detriment of my grades and, and other things. Um, and so I just was fascinated. I was awed by these games. And so, uh, so if you flash forward to today, so 30 years later when I actually have a real job, I can actually make 
those same games. So the games that my parents used to go out and pay 30, went to Sears and paid $30 for, are the games that, that I can now make myself uh, within a day or two. And I can, not only that, I can share them with people. I share them with Morgan. I waste the time of the people in my lab by sharing these games with them. Uh, and I could do that all on my, I can do that all on my own. And the question that you should ask yourself is, how did I get to this point? Well, I got to this point through having a great education. And that education is represented by the books that are on my bookshelf. And so I essentially learned computer science, which is how I learned how to program and understand how computers work. Uh, math and physics, which lets me like, make games that move and look realistic, just like it does in the real world, or at least something that's believable enough. Uh, a little bit about electronics, so I understood how computers worked at their lowest level. Um, computer graphics, so I could make interactive 3D worlds. Um, computer vision, so I could enable robots and computers to see things in the real world. Oh, computer vision didn't show up, there we go. And, uh, and robotics, to make machines move in the actual real physical world. So using this knowledge, what I was able to do is take is make my own video games and technology. So at, as a student, uh, what you're seeing is an early project that I did. It was uh, I just made a virtual baseball game so I could see the world. I could had immersive head-mounted display that let me see the world. So it was an image projected directly, directly on top of my eyes. I had a bat I could swing, and so it was a real immersive uh, experience. I could, felt like I was actually swinging the bat. Um, I made a, we made a racing game where we could, move our, we could drive the car by essentially moving our hand in front of a camera. Uh, that may seem, uh, that, believe it or not, uh, that was state of the art for 1997. So, so now we have Wii's and Connects, but uh, but that was that was a big deal back then. Um, we took that system even further to be able to not just track the hand, but even track the body. So we used the tracking of the body to to control a physically simulated humanoid robot. And then we took that system even further by enabling uh, by enabling a person to control a robot, a real physical robot, directly using their body. And so what you're seeing right here is Nathan controlling the, the NASA Robonaut. So an early version of the, of the, of the, of the NASA Robonaut. The version, Robonaut version 2 is actually on the International Space Station right now. But you can, try to, you can try to move like the robot if you want to. It actually makes a really interesting dance. Not like the Dougie, but kind of like the Nathan, which is kind of cool. Um, but, but you could think of those, those, those little devices on his arms as sort of like Wiimotes before they were Wiimotes. Um, we wanted the robot to not just copy your motion, but, even, but actually be able to interact with you like a partner. Uh, so we basically had systems that could now track you and then uh, could, under, could see and recognize a person. And then we'd use that recognition to be able to have a robot follow a person. And we essentially used, as, 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 as well as he stated, Hook's Law to be able to do this. Um, and so, so that was really great when quadrotor helicopters started to become really, really, uh, really, uh, we could start to buy them off the shelf and we could use them it, for, our, for our regular research. And so what you're seeing here is Evan with the, with the AR drone. Um, and so what, he, what we're able to do is there's a frontward facing camera on the robot and it can see an AR tag, which is called an augmented reality tag. And from that camera, we can essentially have the robot, uh, robot follow that person. And so we want to we wanna show you just a quick little, little programming demo of it because we want you to, to be able to do this for yourself. Uh, but before we do that, um, we're gonna, we're just, I'll, just I'll just have a quick reminder while we have, uh, have the, the talented and lovely Alice uh, come out and help us with the programming demo uh, and, and get our volunteer. Uh, one thing that you should always be aware of when you're, when you're using robots is to be careful around them. Robots are fun, but bad things can happen like that. Uh, so just be, be careful. And with that, I will... Uh, hand it over to Alice. Great, so we, can we have a volunteer from the audience? Great, so what's your name? My name is Simon. Simon, thanks for being willing to help us today. Stand right here. So what you're gonna help us demonstrate is the simulation of a drone following an AR tag. So if you take the mouse and click on the AR tag and drag it around, and drag it all over the screen. Great, so we see how the drone is following the AR tag and it follows at a set distance as if it's connected with a virtual spring. So you see if you go toward the drone, it backs up, and you go away, and it will follow. Great, so, so the program that makes this happen is gonna be available to you. I'm gonna show you, there it is. So on the left side, that's the code, and on the right side is the drone and the AR tag, and this is in JS Fiddle, so go ahead, you can move it again. So these are the same settings as the first, the first time I showed you. Now I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is show you that we can change the properties of the spring. 
So first, we're going to make the sti spring stiffer. So I'm going to make this from 0.05 to 0.5, and then click over here on Run. So now let's see what the how the stiffness has changed. Great. So now, when we move the air tag, the drone acts like it's connected with a rigid spring, a really stiff spring that doesn't, that doesn't stretch hardly at all. So now, we'll change the rest distance. We'll make the, the drone stay farther away. Click Run. So there it goes. So again, this is something you can do at home. This is, uh, you can just open it up in your web browser. Thanks a lot, Simon. So how did that demo work? So they were changing all sorts of parameters, but what did those parameters mean? Essentially what we did was we programmed a virtual spring into the, into the controller of the robot. What that virtual spring does is it makes sure that the robot stays the appropriate rest distance away from the AR tag. Um, that rest distance essentially is equivalent to the rest distance of the spring. So if I have a spring right here, so, with the, so the rest distance is the length of the spring when it's not being pulled on or pushed on, right? And so we put that, so the, what the controller does is put that spring right there. And so if the, if the person gets too far away from the, from the drone, essentially what happens is a restorative force comes and pushes the drone back, pulls the drone back to the safe rest distance so that, so that they can be close, so the drone can follow. If the person gets too close, which isn't, which is, which isn't very safe, essentially we have, the, we have the, the spring pushes back out and brings the robot back to the, to the safe rest distance. And so that essentially is what we do to program, uh, program robots using Hook's Law. Did somebody say Hook? Not that Hook. <laughs> so Hook's Law actually isn't that complicated. So it, it actually just says that, that the control force we have, the force that pushes, that pushes the, the, the drone forward or backwards, is equal to negative one times some number that Alice was, was showing that represents the stiffness of the spring times the distance the robot is away from its rest position. And because science is really about doing for yourself, right? You should never trust anything anybody says until, unless you can do it yourself. You should, can, now is a good time to figure out to learn how to program because that can be very easily programmed in. And we're just gonna show you a few quick examples of that. Um, and so, so earlier last week, Morgan just sat down and said, here's Hook's Law and, and, uh, and she just programmed into Scratch. So many of you may be familiar with Scratch. Uh, that, that program is everything that you need to do to have, like, have essentially the, the scratch cat follow, around, follow your mouse cursor. Um, also, the drone, the drone simulation that we had, as Alice pointed out, is available on our website, programs for, programs for .me. Um, and also, I wanted to just finish up by saying that you don't need, we want to reemphasize that you don't need the AR tag, right? You can have the robot essentially follow you by recognizing where you are, and we're just using a regular old Microsoft Connect camera. Uh, and, it's being, and that camera is being used to follow Ling Zhu around, as you saw in that video. And I think that's a really amazing video. I think you should pay a lot of attention to that video. Um, oh, there we go. VR2, can you stop here? Can you stop here? Leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ling Zhu. Just to reemphasize, science is about seeing for yourself. Never trust the video. Um, and so, so I, think that's, uh, I, I think that just sort of highlights what we can, what we can do. So what we're, what we're aiming for is by the time Morgan is my age, uh, that she's able, that we actually make robots a reality. The robots are no longer purely science fiction. Robots are real and they're here today, and what we're trying to do is make robots, trying to find new ways to make robots more useful for people. And you are the future scientists engineers who will make the breakthroughs and develop the technology that we will all use in the future. Someday, robots like the PR2 will be as common as computers, and we need your help to make that future a reality. What makes my job really cool is I get to help you make that reality. And so what we need you to do is be able to learn how to program. All the examples that we have are free, available for you to use, learn from, do it better, and show us how we can make robots a reality. And so for myself, Morgan, uh, all the people in my group, 
we want to really invite you to come be one of us and help science move, move, move ahead and make robots a reality. Thank you very much. Awesome.